Welcome everyone to the College of Law and Centre for Legal Innovations New Law Careers Summit 2022 for your lunchtime session to find out more about what it's like consulting within the legal profession. Hello, I'm Alison Laird, a Senior Director and Global Head of Change Management and User Adoption at Moray Global, and I am delighted to be acting as a facilitator and host for this session on the role of consultants, which I'll be discussing with this stellar panel on your screen. Uh, today with me, I have Beth Patterson, who's the Director of ESP Connect, Joel Kennedy, the Head of Client Projects from Lana and Rogers, Emma Peters, Special Counsel from Carol Clark, and Mick Shee, partner for New Law PwC Australia. So I'm guessing many of you will have heard the rather unflattering comment that what consultants do is borrow your watch to tell you the time and then they charge you for it. <laughs> now, I may be biased, but I'd like to think that consultants have come a long way since then, and particularly in the legal profession. So today I see consultants are actually offering new insights and expertise and helping to deliver transformative advisory work that we're adding real value and improving business performance. So what do <laughs> consultants consult about in the legal profession? So let's jump right in and challenge each of our panel members to sum up in 25 <laughs> words or less what it is you do as a consultant in the legal profession. So let's start with Beth. Thanks, Alison. And I'd just like to thank Terry Muttershead and CLI for putting this on. It's long overdue for our industry. Um, so really quickly, as you said, I'm director of ESP Connect, a legal tech and innovation consultancy. I work with clients across the legal ecosystem to maximize the value of digital transformation in the practice of law and future of work. Three main categories of work, strategy, implementation, and education. And also I'm an adjunct professor in the UTS Faculty of Law. Thank you. Great, thanks, Beth. So Joel, what about you? Hi, thanks, Alison. Um, yeah, so I'm a head of client projects team at Lander and Rogers, the law firm, national law firm in Australia. Um, so my role is, uh, I guess, we draw upon uh, expertise in law, business, technology, and my key role is to advise, support, and guide our clients on process optimization and business transformation solutions. Perfect. And Emma? Hello. So I am a special counsel at Cal Clark, um, a national law firm in Australia, um, and I lead our ESG team. So I work with a variety of businesses to uh, implement ESG strategies and solutions. Thanks, Emma. And definitely last but not least, Mick. Thanks, Alison. Great to be here. So Mick Shee, I'm a partner at PwC New Law. In New Law, we help legal departments and law firms with transformation, optimization, and digitization. And we also provide managed legal services for high volume, more commoditizable work. Excellent. So I wonder if I just pose a question to all of you, and I'm happy for any of you to, to jump in. Um, does anyone have an opinion on why you think the legal profession needs consultants? Mick? Sure. So, um, look, the, I, I would say that the legal profession needs consultants because it's been a, it's been a very underserviced area um, historically. I, I came from Telstra and um, Telstra was very good at hiring consultants. We had them marching through the organisation um, you know, on a, on a very regular basis. And particularly when we had the large sort of transformations where we had, you know, the big consultants like McKinsey, et cetera, go through. Um, by the time, that, the time they came to the legal department, we were very much sort of an afterthought. We were much smaller. You know, they, they, um, so A, we wouldn't get a lot of attention, but B, we wouldn't get a lot of expertise. So, and, uh, you know, so the, you know we'd, we'd be sort of right at the end of the queue. They'd come in and talk to our leadership team and tell us um, uh, what they probably thought up in the hallway while they're waiting to be let in. And uh, then we would, we'd march it back to the C-suite and, um, and let them know that everything we just got told was irrelevant because we're special and the consultants don't understand us. But there's been so much change in the legal industry. So we've had a whole range of new service providers. We've got a whole bunch of new technologies that have all come in the last five to 10 years. 
Um, we've got a whole bunch of new skills that are being uh, hired into legal departments. And so this is all new for the legal industry, particularly for legal departments. And so consultants are more important now to be able to come in and help legal departments navigate all these new choices that they have to make. So it's a really exciting time to be a consultant in the legal industry. And it's a, it's a service that we need now more than ever. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with that. And it is that new and emerging field. And some of the other sessions we've heard um, earlier yesterday and today uh, are all different types of consulting roles when you look at them. So Emma, yours is a little bit different. Do you want to talk a little bit more about um, in your role? Uh, you know, you're a, a different sort of consultant within a law firm specialising in the emergency sort of ESG field. Can you share sort of some of what's involved in that as, you know, as a lawyer and how your role's evolved and why you think consultants are important in the, in the industry? Yeah, so I guess I'm maybe slightly different from the other panellists. I'm um, in a law firm and I've paved a way um, as more of that kind of hybrid consulting um, role. So I work within um, ESG, which is a pretty say, new area on a, on a whole. Um, and it's a lot around um, looking at risk with a variety of different clients, um, gauging, I guess, that balance between risk and commercial appetite, um, and then coming up with strategies that surround that. So I would say, um, you know, yes, in a law firm, but working um, in a very different and emerging area has really lended itself to this kind of consulting area. Yeah, so I think there's a whole range, and we're going to dig into those a, a little bit deeper, but I think already we're starting to see from the responses that, um, that we've already heard that this is potentially one of the most exciting new careers emerging, so the roles and the tasks and the variety, and there's there's a whole heap that I think we can explore, and um, I, I will go through and, and have a chat to each of you on this, but I thought it might be useful to start actually with you, Mick, because when it comes to consulting in the legal profession, as you sort of said, you know, I, I think few would probably disagree that working in one of the big four is, is one of the first roles that might come to mind when we think about consultants. So I wonder if you'd like to share what the primary driver was for you in making that leap from being Telstra's GC into PwC's new law team. And has it been everything you've expected? Have there been any successes or challenges you've encountered along the way in this new consulting role? Yeah, thanks, Alison. Well, yeah, if I go back to the, that, you know, the, that Telstra time and the McKinsey experience, I certainly did feel that there was a, a gap in the market in terms of really experienced cons, you know, consultants in the legal um, profession. I think the law firms have been, you know, have had the benefit of consultants for a lot longer, but legal departments less so. Um, and that's also partly because um, the legal sort of tech solutions have been later to um, arrive for, for, for legal departments. But from where I was sitting as a general counsel in Telstra, I was really struggling to put all the pieces together. There were just so many different new products coming up every day. Lots of really sort of small consultants with great ideas that um, I, I wanted to use them all, but I didn't, you know, I didn't know where to start or how to prioritise or how to make the budget for them. Clearly, loads of different choices around you know, alternative legal service providers. And so for me, it seemed that there was a, a need for a role for the big four to actually come and start to package this up. And so I sort of consider my role now in the big four as being, um, it's, we, we, build, we build a team, but I'm also, I'm also here to help legal departments sort of navigate all the different choices with all the, the, the amazing choices they have out there, which include other consultants. We work with other consultants as well. We're not... Um, Sort of exclusive in that way because we know that there's um, you know, the right combination of skills and services for any particular client is probably not going to come from one particular place. So that was the main impetus for me going and joining the big four and, and I've absolutely loved it. There ha has it been what I expected it to be? Um, look, I, I, no, like it's, um, <laughs> there's, uh, I don't think I knew what I was get, getting into, but I would say that the thing that's been most successful is that um, how, building a team that many, and I suspect we'll talk about this a bit more today, but that, that have got either come from a legal background or at least understand legal businesses gives us credibility. And that's really helped us, um, I guess, make inroads with clients. Whereas, you know, the, um, the big four and the McKinsey's of the world who haven't had that legal expertise probably have struggled in the past. In terms of challenges, um, the number one challenge is that Pretty much everything we're doing with clients 
they're doing for the first time and quite often we're doing for the first time. So um, that, that is, there is a challenge to that, um, but there's also a huge amount of excitement to that. So it's uh, you know, great being in a sort of pioneering, innovative, cutting edge part of the, the legal market. Um, it's got its, its challenges, but it's also you know, its upsides as well. So. Well, I think as a, as a true consultant, we wouldn't say that there are challenges, just opportunities, right? Isn't that how we all kind of operate? And that, that's what we're looking for is, uh, is how to overcome some of those. And I guess I think when most people think of being a consultant in the legal profession, they probably think of people like yourself and, and, and me as well, external consultants from large global consulting businesses brought in to advise both in-house legal teams or law firms and we review and we analyze and importantly challenge the status quo. So we provide recommendations on how to streamline or improve efficiencies, maybe reduce costs, maybe how to best leverage legal tech to augment the delivery of legal services or help to better manage you know, the people side of change. And then we get out and we exit the business and hopefully we're leaving them on a better path. But there are also a lot of other consultants working in legal. So Joel, you're one of those. In your role, you're providing a very similar advisory service from within a law firm. So I wanted to know, you know, how does being an internal consultant give you an edge? And what are the sort of things you do within Land and Rogers of their head of client projects? Um, yeah, I guess probably the first thing is that in many cases, I suppose my team's clients are actually already the firm's clients, not in all cases, but in, in many. And um, they're typically, as you say, in legal teams within kind of medium, large organisations. But because they're already our clients, we kind of already have that like, trusted relationship with them. We're not going to disappear after the project's been implemented. Kind of, but, So we're invested in making sure that whatever that change we're implementing is going to be continued success. Um, and that relationship also means that we have you know, in-depth understanding often of how that client's business works albeit from the legal perspective um, but also you know the challenges faced by the legal team who are working with them um, so it might be for example like managing their workloads or demonstrating the value to their business um, so maybe in that way we're perhaps a, a little less salesy and more focused on getting the right kind of projects for, for our team um, and like secondly we being part of a kind of large law firm, we've got access to legal tech at a scale. So we can often demonstrate um, platforms which are legal, smaller legal teams might not have seen before and, um, and perhaps might be out of reach for them. Um, but we can perhaps leverage some of that technology to um, help with the kind of projects that, that we work with them for. Yeah, and I think there's definitely some advantages of having all those skills within uh, a law firm environment to, to help clients deliver what they need to. Um, and, and Beth, you've had an interesting experience because you spent more than 20 years inside a law firm driving the legal technology agenda. So wondering what was it that prompted you to take that consulting leap outside of a law firm environment into ESP Connect? And you know, what are the sort of services you provide and how has that shift from law firm to consultant outside helped you to help lawyers embrace and adopt change? Thanks, Alison. Um, yeah, I actually spent over 25 years working in law firms, um, but I had a background in software development. I worked for IBM early in my career as a software developer and also um, worked for a, a startup in the financial services space. And strangely, I feel like my career circled back on me um, as I'd sat in a law firm as a legal technologist and a leader. All of a sudden, innovation hit the scene, you know, five five or so years ago, and it became a strategic center because tech was now driving significant change as an enabler. And I guess I felt I'd done a lot um, to pioneer legal tech within the, the law firm environment. And I was really interested in working across the legal ecosystem and um, the, the title or sort of my business name, Connect, is about connecting the legal ecosystem, um, because I believe that in order to actually leverage tech, to actually create the benefit and the change to the industry, it's about connecting these two diverse groups, lawyers and technologists, that we all know talk different languages, live different cultures, one's logic, one's words, one's 
creating something to be interpreted in the future. One's creating something to be perfect in the current state. And, and so my experience that I gained leading a team of over 50 people, building a multidisciplinary team over 20 years, um, quite successfully, I've brought to the consulting field. Um, and I guess I had three big motivations. One is to work across that ecosystem. Two is to accelerate the change in the market. Everything's slow, lawyers are risk adverse, and really trying to tackle the cultural change that's needed. Um, and I felt like I could do that in a position of a, a consultant. And finally, I think it gets talked about a lot, but there's a huge justice gap. Access to justice is really, um, you know, calling out for change and automation. And I'm really interested in some of the pro bono work I do in that space. Um, so at the end of the day, being a consultant, what motivates me? I like seeing my clients succeed. I get really excited to be able to bring my experience to the table and add value to what they're doing and see their successes in this great world of change. Great, thanks, Beth. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot in there, even just in those comments, and Emma, the ones that you added before about your role as a, as a lawyer. Uh, and, you know, I, I did hear um, Mel uh, say in an earlier session, it's, it's like we join the dots, and, and that's kind of what we do. I think we're the translators sometimes between, you know, what the what the client needs and what the business needs and what's out there and what's available. And sometimes it's even just opening the eyes to the art of the possible and because people don't know what they don't know. And sometimes the experience that we have in that sort of environment is being able to, to do that and shine a light. Um, so there's a lot of variety in there. I wonder if anyone, and this is this is sort of a big, big question, but, um, you know, because a day in the life of a consultant um, in the legal you know, profession could be a whole range of things. Um, Emma, I'm, I'm assuming it's probably a little bit different for you because you're still practicing as well. But do you mm. want to give us just a couple of things? What's a day in the life for, for you? So um, incredibly varied, I would say. So meeting with a lot of different clients from a lot of different backgrounds with um, a huge amount of like, different opportunity. Um, so for me, it's really um, uh, spending time to understand the client's business, their risk tolerances, and then essentially jumping from, um, you know, client to client and then working with our team to put those um, strategies in place. So uh, often a lot of working with boards um, and exec teams to, to understand what their objectives are um, and then from there actually seeing it through and putting it into action. Yeah. I think there's a, there are definitely some parallels, though, with a more traditional consulting role. So, yeah. Mick, what are, you know, what are, like, you know, five of the key tasks that you do in a day? Well, you know, my team um, does a whole variety of stuff. Yeah, we essentially are reviewing legal departments and law firms and then providing recommendations on a whole range of things from organisational design to technology choices or automation programs or demand management choices, client experience, um, right resourcing, sort of basically everything in law other than legal advice. But, um, and so it's, I think it's you know, hugely sort of rich in terms of variety, in terms of what, what we're doing. But my, personally, what am I doing? I'm mostly focused on, I guess, sort of you know, building and nurturing a really high quality team. I mean, I'm just, blessed with the, the most amazing um, people who are coming to this space because they see it as a really exciting um, career journey. And so we've got a lot of great talent, particularly young talent that really see a future for themselves. So that's sort of my number one job. And my second job is sort of uh, convincing clients that we're the right team to help them on their journey. But I do a bunch of other things, but I would say they're my, the two most important things I do. So there is actually a question that's popped up um, in the, the Q&A um, and it's about the, the panel has experienced selling consulting services to law firms and in-house teams and, and I think that, that builds on what you've just said then Mick. Uh, the question here is it, is it harder to sustain a consulting practice serving law firms or in-house teams? Do you have any thoughts on that? I mean I know you're focused mostly on the, the in-house side but do you find one easier than the other? Uh, so uh, um, I mean, I'll, I'll quickly go first because we do, I think about this all the time. 
Um, uh, we we um, started off focusing on legal departments because that's where we came from, that's what we knew, and that's where we saw there was a big need. Um, I think that there is absolutely a market for law firms. And in fact, you know, consultants have been around establishing relationships with law firms for a lot longer than we've been in existence. Um, but you know, at the big end of town, a lot of the law firms have built their own in-house capability. And whilst I'm sure they still use consultants, there's a, you know, they, they are um, a lot more self-sufficient than, than a lot of legal departments have traditionally been. Um, the other thing is in Big Four, we also do, um, we provide legal services. Um, we have a law firm. So there is a perception out there that we compete with them. I don't, I don't think that that um, yeah, should always be a, a blocker. And, and we're doing some really great stuff with law firms. And it's actually, a, you know, it's a new growth area for us. And we've recently bought on a, um, a boutique law firm consultant um, who and his practice that focuses on customer experience for law firms. So I think the, the future is bright. I think we'll always be a bit more skewed in terms of our, uh, you know, our, I guess our market focus towards in, in-house, but um, you know, because I think there are just slightly less challenges than the ones I've just outlined. I'd, I'd just add to that, Alison, I've worked, uh, you know, with law firms, corporates, service providers, tech companies and universities. And I think the, the key in it is understanding the culture of each type of organisation um, and understanding big, small but law firms have a particular culture that's different than a corporate. Uh, uh, with no disrespect, Mick, but in corporates, law, lawyers aren't the key players. You know, they're the guys that are protecting the risk. The business is the key. And I find often in the corporate side, the, the tech, the CIO has way more power than the GC. Um, and, and understanding those organizational dynamics is super important in terms of how you sell um, consulting services. And again, um, I guess having experience across all of it, you need to make sure you get those nuances right in the way you sell to them. Yeah, and certainly from my own experience, having worked as an internal sort of consultant in big law and then now externally for both in-house and legal teams, uh, you know, I think there are, the, the nuances definitely uh, uh, are different because law firms and the legal profession is is slightly unique, or at least they'll tell you they are. Um, but I think the again understanding that culture is really important. So maybe that's a good segue into, you know, a, a number of the other sessions have have posed the do you need to be a lawyer question to excel in a new new law career? Um, resoundingly, no has been the answer. In our case, it's going to be a little bit different because, Emma, obviously you're consulting in a hybrid legal advice role. But in general, and as someone who isn't legally qualified, I may be biased, but I tend to agree that you don't necessarily need a law degree to be a great consultant in the legal profession. So I guess my question for this panel is slightly different. If you are consulting to legal teams, and Beth, you touched on this, you know, do you need exposure at least to the legal profession to be successful? So, Joel, I might start with you about, you know, what your th thoughts are on this. How important do you think it is to understand the profession generally? And I do think it helps. I certainly think, um, like, either being a lawyer or having that legal background certainly helps you be, build trust, speak the same language. Um, but I think kind of, you know, there are some core skills which are going to um, you know, help you more, which is you know, empathy, kind of good listening skills, um, being able to put yourself in other people's shoes, understand other people's perspectives. And um, I think particularly when you're um, you know, assisting legal teams, like think about who are their key stakeholders, who are their, um, who's their audience. So that might be you know, delivering a piece of legal advice in a different way so that the legal team can then easily disseminate that amongst their business. Um, uh, there's lots of ways you can approach it. Um, but, you know, I've come, my background has been from technology. I started off on a, on a help desk um, at a law firm. I've come through uh, project management, business analysis, business process mapping. You know, there's a variety of kind of roles that I've had in legal, which all of, I think have helped contribute to uh, being in this role and I think that you don't have to be a lawyer to um, yeah, to, to to succeed as a consultant in this industry. 
And I think that that's um, an interesting perspective as well in terms of the different pathways of people getting into these roles. And we'll talk a little bit about the skills and experience about what we think would make a successful uh, consultant as well. But before we get there, I wonder, Emma, if um, as a as a lawyer practicing in a specific area and specialising, do you have any advice for other lawyers and how they might be able to evolve their role to be more than just providing legal advice? Um, yeah, I guess my, my angle is slightly different to the other panellists, but um, obviously, uh, from, from my perspective, having that legal um, framework in mind is is critical, but really, um, from my perspective, and it's probably been talking about a bit, it's really getting to know the, the business that you're dealing with. So, um, with some of my, my clients, I almost um, feel like I'm on tap as their um, mini in-house person because, um, you know, yes, you have that legal framework in mind, but it often comes back to questions around um, risk appetite, for instance. So, for, I think it's really actually spending the time getting to know the business um, and then you can kind of look for opportunity and um, potential risk just outside of the pure legal. Yeah, I, I think that getting to know the business and understanding it and, as Beth, you said, the culture and, and all of those nuances in there are really important regardless of what sort of role you're in. Uh, and, and, Mick, you, you sort of mentioned about, you know, the your target focus is on the in-house community because you saw the gaps and you saw how, you know, the legal team were usually left to last because no one really knows what to do with them and they never have time for the consultants to come in anyway and they don't really know what they're talking about because they don't know what you do. So do you think that your previous experience in as a GC has definitely helped you in this current role or are there other pathways? You said you've got a whole bunch of great juniors coming in. What are their sort of pathways that they're coming into this sort of role now? Yeah, so th there's absolutely no doubt that my um, being a general counsel and having that, um, you know, I, I was 14 years at Telstra, that that was all hugely important for getting this business started. Um, when, I first, uh, when I first approached PwC, and said, look, I think there's an opportunity for the big four to um, start up a new law practice. This is what it would look like. You know, their response to me was, um, we had a series of conversations. And when I got to the last one, um, the, the sort of most senior one, they said, look, um, it, was, it was the easiest and quickest. They said, we've done heaps of um, amazing work in tax transformation. But we've always looked at legal departments and felt they're like three or four times the size. So there's been this huge opportunity. We've not had anybody with the expertise to do it. So let's let's do it. So that was that was great. And I would never have been, we would never would have got started if I hadn't had that background and insight. But now as we build the team, um, it's becoming less and less important because we're building a team of really diverse capabilities and people who have got, you know, many of them have got some sort of legal background, but others are more management consulting and digital, et cetera. I think it becomes less important that every individual has legal background, but it's really critical that there's a core legal capability within the team that everyone can, can lean off. And so I think it's become, yeah, you know, we're gonna get more and more variety of backgrounds from different people. Um, I think we'll still have a bias towards people who have worked in law firms and legal departments, but not all of them will be lawyers. Um, probably the you know, really most interesting question that, that I'm seeing some of our junior um, members ask themselves, particularly if they come straight out of university, is do I need to go get a practicing certificate? And I see them struggling with it. And we've had some say, I'm not going to come and join, join you guys. So I've got my practicing certificate. But I'm, and others who have started with us and said, hang on, I'm actually going to go now and leave you guys and go get my practicing certificate. And I think I really understand or empathize with it because I think that practicing certificate gives you options. But I think that um, it's not particularly critical to, um, I think it's you know, great that they've had legal training. Some of them had experience as clerks in law firms, et cetera. But the practicing certificate is probably not that critical to being a consultant. But it's interesting to see that little, that struggle going on at the junior level as to whether or not you uh, sever your, your, your option on becoming a lawyer and go and become a consultant or try and keep, you know, hedge your bets and keep them both open for yourself. Mick, just on that, I know one of the questions we used to ask when we were building out a multidisciplinary team, if somebody had a law degree was, do you want to practice? Because we were trying to figure out what the risk was that they would come to us and then go back into practice. And so you're trying to feel out whether or not 
they've had they've done their legal practice they're tired of it they're never going back or they've never done it and they're going to want to do it in the future and it's it's really important like you totally agree you need that some legal expertise in the team and we used to look at legal technical project management and commercial skills and you need that multidisciplinary skill set and variety and the ability to work in a team and I think you know, in the consulting space, being able to build a team that actually understands each other is critical in what we do. So if you are, Beth, building those multidisciplinary teams and, and they are looking at um, how they fit together and how they, you know, click in, uh, you know, and on the back of everything else that we've heard already uh, today, what are some of the, the skills that you think make a really great consultant? Yeah, so, so the first thing is there's some level of expertise that you bring to the table and, you know, this panel represents a big variety of what that expertise might look like. But I think you, you've got to have something. And I was thinking about it, preparing for this. It's sort of um, uh, you need to be a jack of all trades and a master of some. So, so you need this variety, but you need to actually have that expertise. The second is... Um, I think we touched on it earlier, just the influencing and confidence to, to bring that expertise to the table. Communication skills are absolutely critical. Um, business acumen and, and problem solving. I think one thing that technologists and lawyers do have in common is they're great problem solvers and one uses language and one uses logic. Um, and I think there's one that I not many people talk about, but I certainly found it super important within a law firm and to a degree outside a law firm, and that's humility. And I don't know if that's a skill or, or a trait or a value, but when you're working in a legal environment, I, I do think there's a lot of humility that you have to bring to the table. Yeah, that's a really interesting one. I think it goes well with the empathy and putting yourself in somebody else's shoes to understand what are the issues that you know are coming up and how do we try and say, solve those pain points, regardless of what area of consulting that we're in. So Emma, I wonder what sort of um, you know, lawyer skills translate well into being a successful consultant? I think um, listening is a really big one. And by listening, I mean like active listening. I think um, sometimes we're very good at telling people what to do, but we actually haven't listened to the full picture. Um, so I think that's probably the top one, a bit of creativity um, and then just your people skills, just actually, um, you know, working collaboratively, um, being a team member. They're some of the things that probably sound a bit simple, but really jump out to me. No, I think the creative and collaboration and people skills and all of those sorts of things, um, particularly, as you say, that active listening before jumping to a solution, yeah. uh, and particularly in, in the legal sphere, you know, lawyers are great at coming up with solutions, but, you know, sometimes it's better to take a step back and do a little bit more, you know, whether it's design thinking or whether it's, you know, a bit more investigation in it is, um, can be key. Uh, so, Joel, do you have any skills or capabilities that you'd recommend, um, you know, are required to deliver successful client projects? Yeah. Um, well, Emma kind of uh, said what, what I'd planned to say, but I'd probably add to that is a, um, maybe project management, uh, the kind of core project management skills, project management business analysis type skills are really helpful. Uh, change management as well is a big one. Um, and I, I think... For the more legally focused, I, I guess people coming up through that legal technologist type uh, type role uh, it can also be a career path into consultancy. So yeah, I think you've added um, some interesting ones there as well in terms of the legal tech and the change management, which is increasing importance. I might be biased on that too, given the role I'm currently in. Um, but uh, I, I think that that also leads into for those people that are starting to think that they might like to explore becoming a consultant, because it sounds really great, right? Um, I was wondering if each of you can share maybe three words that describe what it was that appealed to you the most about taking on a different or non-traditional role. So essentially in three words, why did you want to become a consultant? So Joel, why don't you kick that off? Okay, uh, I'll go with variety, um, curiosity, and innovation, three I'd pick. 
Great words. Emma? Oh, Joel, now you're stealing mine. I was going to say um, yeah, innovation, um, probably the challenge, and then um, a bit more commerciality. And Mick? Uh, so value creation, that's hyphenated, one word. Uh, Co-creation. <laughs> Is that, is, that, is that cheating? I'm not sure if that's cheating, but yeah, we'll okay. take that, value creation. Uh, Co-creation and um, creativity. So it's a lot about creating in there. It's, yeah, it's very cool. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, Beth, uh, you, you kind of already mentioned yours earlier, but is there anything you wanted to expand on? You, you did sort of say that you wanted to, you know, it was across the ecosystem and to accelerate change and the access to justice and the cultural bit. Can you, can you narrow it down into three words? Why did you want to become a consultant? Yeah, sure. Um, so my three words, like Joel, variety. Uh, I think consulting gives an amazing amount of variety. So variety is top of my list. Independence. Um, I, I think consultants, you walk in and there's a level of independence that you get, um, that you don't get in other roles. And flexibility. And I think that that brings in the agile, creative innovation that people have been speaking about. Yeah, no, and I certainly echo the the variety and the ability to you know solve problems and and that it's I kind of like the fact that it's project based. You know, usually it's a, got a beginning and an end, uh, and so you can really get in and, and solve a, an issue and then move on to something that might be completely different. And so I think the variety is one of the things that, um, you know, so while we've had a whole bunch of different pathways into where we all are here today, I think the motivations looking at that sort of list are, are very similar um, in, in that. So I think that there is some common threads in there. Um, so we'll, we've got a few questions sitting here uh, in, in the panel. So I might actually just uh, pop into those and, and ask a couple in here. Uh, does anyone think that um, they uh, want to outline key differences between working in a law firm and working in a consulting company? I, I, I guess I've done both, but I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I can even answer that. Um, I think the, the key differences for me was being the internal expert versus being the external expert. Um, and I found in big global law firms, you might be saying all of these really uh, you know, cool and interesting and exciting things, but until someone from outside the business came in and said the same things, no one believed you. Um, and so I do think that there's an advantage about being an external consultant um, in, in that respect. Hopefully that's changing now as these roles are becoming broader and uh, you know, more prolific. Um, does anyone else have anything to add into that experience, either or? Uh, uh, similar to you, Alison, I think within a law firm, a lot of what you do is convincing quietly and, and it's not a big bang um, and it's harder to shift. But when you're external as a consultant, if people are engaging you, they want something. And so there's a, a direct motivation for what you're doing. Um, and so I think within a law firm, influencing skills are critical. Um, one of the things I used to say is um, if you, your job is actually to make the lawyer you're working with a partner, and if they're already a partner, make them the best partner in the firm, and that's success. Um, and external as a consultant, you want your clients to be successful and succeed at whatever their goal is. Yeah, and I think it's all that sort of success-oriented, you know, future forecasting and how we're all working to a common sense of purpose um, that helps to drive those sort of, you know, the, the, whether it's from within the law firm or consulting to legal um, in-house teams. I think that that's a common thread as well in there. Uh, another question um, from David is, is if there was any particular non-legal qualification or skill set that is going to be really valuable in your law consulting. Um, Go ahead. Oh, sorry, Beth. Um, I'll, 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 my thoughts on that question. One of the most exciting things I'm seeing at the moment um, with legal departments in-house is them starting to realise the opportunity to influence the outcomes on work that's legal in nature, but it's sitting outside the legal department, specifically areas like contracts and dispute management. 
And the ability to influence outcomes tends to center around the technology that is getting implemented by the organization to do that. So I think that um, legal departments and consultants are gonna find more and more value in legal technologists and data, um, and data analytics to be able to help drive that leadership and provide that value in implementing the, these sort of technologies that are, that are, are solutions for legal work, but it's not necessarily traditionally the domain of, of the legal department. And to me, that's that's going to be a huge opportunity for legal departments to unlock. And I think that any uh, sort of new entrants that have got those type of skills are going to have a great career in, in, in new law, whether it be in-house or even in law firms or in, as, in, as a consultant. Just, just to add to what Mick said, legal technology skills coupled with excellent communication and interpersonal skills is your ticket. <laughs> if, if you have both those, because often with the tech skills, a lot of people don't seem to have as great of interpersonal skills where lawyers do. And if you can't connect that, whatever piece of the technology you're working on, whether it's customer experience, design, development, if you can't connect that back, it's tough to succeed. So, so if you have the tech degree, go out and do presentation skills and influencing and networking and all of that um, to build out the interpersonal and, and the ability to communicate. And, and I would back that up and add to it and also what Joel had said about change management, because uh, it doesn't matter how great any tech or any you know, change or innovation program is, if people don't adopt it or don't use it the right way or don't do things um, as it's intended to be or you know what it's going to morph into, then it's not going to work and people it's it'll fail. So you know I think that that's a really big driver as well as is making sure that we manage those expectations and manage the messaging effectively. Um, some of the other questions in here for the lawyers in the room, uh, looking at you, uh, Mick and Emma, uh, is there any legal professional ethics issue when being a consultant? So the example was, you know, subsection 10 and 11 about current and full monarch client privilege. <laughs> any comments on that? Great question. Um, do you want me to jump in, Joel? Um, obviously, uh, it can be a bit of a fine line um, sometimes, so it kind of um, fits back into the way you're structuring the service offering. Um, for instance, um, here at Carl Clark, we have a, a wholly owned subsidiary, which is our consulting arm. So that um, delivers the consulting services, and then we have the, the legal sitting behind that. Um, with what I do, it's intrinsically still aligned to legal, to a legal framework or legal background. Um, so it's not um, as complicated, I would say, but um, I, I can see your point, but there, there are certainly ways you can structure it. And I think that also builds on one of the other questions in here about the traditional law firm model and the values and work ethos and career path generally for lawyers. Uh, and particularly if they're going to, you know, increase that uptake of consultancy work. Um, and, you know, it does seem like more lawyers and the question is sort of, you know, are they moving to that type of practice? So how do we see that traditional law firm model potentially changing? Um, and I think maybe, Joel, this might be one for you in, you know, with the IHUB at Landers. Uh, I think that that's a really great example of potentially how law firms are evolving. Do you want to just uh, chat a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, well, there's a few areas, I guess, here. So <laughs> at Landers, uh, we're, we're soon going to be rotating our grads through our team. And I can see that happening more across other firms as well, where we're actually pulling kind of young lawyers into who are interested in, legal tech and and consulting into our team through one of their rotations so we get their input um, and their expertise and they also get to learn about um, you know how this side of the business works and I think I think you know we've been talking about it for a long time but eventually you know time-based billing it, it will will at least drop off I think maybe never disappear completely but um as the focus moves away from time-based billing and um, lawyers maybe are freed up a little bit to build their expertise in in these uh, in these areas of legal tech and particularly around automation. I'm thinking about one of our lawyers just sat over here from me now, who's uh, you know, a 
an expert on automation so he can bring that skill set to a client and not only be able to um you know talk to them from about the legal side of things but apply that to um to automating documents to uh streamlining their processes and um and kind of understanding how their business works from uh, at a pretty granular level um so yeah i think it's about um about giving lawyers sometimes the space to build up that skill set because you know the, most lawyers are kind of perfectionists by nature i guess and um can you can get stuck in that kind of chicken and egg situation where you don't feel like you've quite got the skill set to to push yourself as an automation lawyer for example um but um yes yeah, so hopefully we are providing people with that that ability to learn and then be able to apply that yeah, and I, I see a lot more law firms now uh, with the evolution of different roles and providing different sorts of services and, and you know, changing into, uh, you know, being a, a business, a professional services business, but with law at its core. Uh, and I think that that's, you know, a trend that we'll see continuing. Um, there's another question in there that um, that I'll, I'll have a crack at as well, but uh, Joel, you might want to add in um, as an intern consultant in a law firm. What does the client engagement letter um, look like in regard to consulting service? Because um, it's not traditional legal advice uh, and services. So from a, a, um, a consultant point of view, generally we have a, a master services agreement and then we do a statement of work and then that's how we get engaged um, from the outside for, for me. But um, what about for some of those projects, uh, Joel, that you're involved in? You know, is it this, is, Do you tack it onto an existing engagement letter or how do you, how do you work it in the firm? Uh, it tends to be very bespoke and uh, we we do lean on uh, one partner in our corporate team in particular who's uh, who's great at, uh, at drafting these up for us uh, for, for specific projects but still fairly bespoke i would say on our side does anyone else have any other um emma how do you how do you you know manage that uh you know dichotomy between what becomes legal advice versus what's consulting advice uh and you know managing that hybrid service there's a fine yeah. line in there and that was one of the other questions in there um how do you manage that um probably similar to joel whereby it really depends on each client and what they're after so it's really a probably a yeah bespoke um uh, instruction and then engagement letter at the outset but um generally we kind of set out the legal component then more of the consulting component um and what's comprised within each and for what arm yeah just to, to jump and in there else and the other thing yeah, go ahead I, you know as as this evolves you know, the structural side of law firms is the critical element you know some law firms have spun out separate businesses just for that purpose <laughs> So they have a different kind of insurance profile, et cetera, for uh, consulting business versus their legal services. Others keep it within the legal business. However, the insurance side differs. Um, so on the one hand, you might be insuring the legal advice side. On the other, you're insuring sort of the non-legal. And I think um, the LPO or legal process outsourcing market pioneered this for the industry in what they did was basically pull out document review from big litigation due diligence and say, this is not legal work. And they were successful in doing that. There was a lot of controversy still is on whether it was or it wasn't, but basically they had to be supervised by a lawyer. So that kind of paved the way for answering that question in terms of structure. So, speaking of lawyer, Mick's raised his hand and wants to jump in and make a comment. Oh, no, I was just, just going to build on what Beth said, and I think that's a really good point about what the, um, the, the path of the LPO is paved. So when it comes to providing consulting services, I think it's fairly straightforward. But when I look at um, where our new law business wants to be and where a lot of new law businesses will want to play, it's in that, I mentioned at the start, that sort of high volume managed manage legal services space. A lot of that work would have been traditionally sort of seen as LPO type work, um, but it's constantly moving up the value chain. And mm -hmm. there's going to be this um, tension between, are we doing work that's 
of that is, you know, I guess the responsibility of the legal department or has some sort of legal nexus, but is not actually legal advice. Um, and when are we going to cross over that line? And that becomes particularly acute um, for the big four in the US where they're not allowed to practice law. And I think actually we'll see in the US and in the big four them test that boundary again and again. And I think it'll be really relevant to this question about when do you cross over that line and provide legal advice as opposed to be providing um, consulting services and non-legal advice in matters that have a legal nature. And is that any different than Mick? There's another question there about for an in-house legal team, do you think there is an inherent conflict about buying solutions from a consulting arm of one of their law firms or does it depend on what the consulting is about? And I guess it's the same in the big four. I mean, if, uh, if uh, they're being audited, you know, they're their auditors do you, and providing legal advice and consulting. I mean, how does that conflict, uh, how do you rationalise that? With auditing, it's it's pretty black and white. We we have to steer clear, and so there's we have very very strict processes to make sure that we're not providing um, most types of consulting services to the clients that we audit. But in terms of law firms providing um, consulting services, I probably think about it a little bit the other way around. Is is in in opening up a cons and I actually maybe even throw this back to you, Alice. Like if you're providing consulting services to clients to try and help them be more efficient. There are some, some people or some of the traditional lawyers will have a view that that's just gonna cut into their business model because the legal departments become more efficient and become less reliant on the legal services. Um, I mean, we have that debate here as well because we provide le you know, legal services. I, I have a particular perspective on that. I'd be interested in your one back to you, Alison, even though I'm not the facilitator. <laughs> <laughs> um, look I think from my perspective, I mean, Joel, I'm sure you've heard this within a law firm as well, and, and Beth, you probably all have actually, um, the argument of why on earth would I want to make things faster, better and cheaper because that's going to impact on the billable hour and the bottom line of my budget. Uh, my argument in response has always been, but hey, if you can do it faster, better, cheaper, more effectively, it frees you up to focus on higher value, better quality and going out and getting more of the same. Um, so it's not that these sort of uh, roles in new law are taking away jobs from lawyers. They're actually helping them to, to do it better. Um, so that that would be my response uh, to that. Um, is, is, did that answer your question, Mick? Yeah, yeah, it's perfect. It's perfect. I knew you'd do a much better job than I would, Alison. <laughs> so we're, we're, we're fast running out of time. There's a couple of questions left on here. Um, one of them from Amy, um, and I don't know, if, has anyone got the answer for how do you find the work-life balance as a consultant? <laughs> I mean, we hear it a lot in the law firms about, you know, the work-life balance and mental health and wellbeing, but what about as a consultant, uh, you know, it's a different kind of ball game. Has anyone got any tips for m managing that balance? Well, I, I, I can jump in because I've got my own business. <laughs> so I, 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 one, of the, one of the pleasures or luxuries perhaps in running your own business is you can pick and choose who you decide to work for, which um, within an organization, I could never do that. Um, that's not available, obviously, to everyone, but I, I have found that really useful in um, managing that work-life balance. Emma, what about yourself in terms of, uh, you know, still practicing lawyer and consulting? Uh, is, it, is it different? Is it easier? Oh, I don't know if I'm the best one to answer this. I don't think I've got the, um, because I don't think I have the answer, but um, I guess for me, I'm, I'm very passionate about what I do. I actually love what I do. So I think that makes the work-life balance question a lot easier. I mean, um, I've personally got a lot of, you know, um, personal rules around when I get home, what that looks like, you know, when I can be contactable and those types of things. But do I um, have the perfect answer? I would say no one is very the individual. Yeah, I mean, I'm probably not the right person to uh, ask that question to either working in a global consultancy with US and UK clients. I tend to be working very early in the morning and very late at night and, you know, try and have a nana nap in the afternoon sometimes. Uh, but, uh, you know, it doesn't always work that way, does it? 
So uh, I think that it, it is a personal decision and you do have to put those boundaries around it and pick and choose, as Beth said, you know, the clients you work with and the projects you take on and, and what is the strategic, you know, version of, of what you want to do versus just taking everything that's available because it's there. Uh, I think that that's a real discipline in there as well. Uh, also, so keen. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry just on that, just a shout out for the younger generation. Um, I think you've brought to the table the ability to have a work-life balance. And this is speaking for the older cohort on, on this um, presentation. But, you know, before we couldn't even talk about work-life balance, you've brought that to the table and it is important and significant. And I think all organizations, big and small, have changed the dial on that. And I also think COVID has helped change the dial on that. And it's your ability as an individual to put your hand up and say, I can't do something. And I think the younger generation has brought that to the table, which is great. Yeah, no, look, I, I completely agree. And I think that that is how the consultant role will actually evolve in the future. And, and Mick's already said, you know, the future is bright and it is new and exciting and different. And uh, just sort of tap off on some of those other questions in there that are very similar about the skills that are important, um, you know, in, in new law. Uh, careers. So the data analysis, design thinking, we've spoken about being creative and the people skills and the project management. Uh, I don't think there is necessarily a best path or specific training or education required to become a legal consultant because it's going to depend on what you're consulting in. So if you want to be a management consultant, you know, do a degree that really interests you, but then get that secondary um, experience. So get an MBA or focus on change management to go with your legal tech. And, you know, I think there's a really interesting hybrid there that, that people could um, to look at exploring. Um, but just before we go, I just want to get one piece of advice, a quick short sentence from each of you. For those um, that are thinking about the switch or the launch into a new law career as a consultant, what, what would be your advice? What's your top tip? So Mick, let's start with you. Well, I think we heard lots of great ideas about um, what it takes to be successful. Probably the, one of the number ones, one number one things. I'm not sure we we touched on, but I think it's really important to have a passion for the developments in this space because it's going to change. It's going to be even more exciting. And if you've got that passion, then I think there'll always be a space for you. Excellent, and Beth. Get what's your advice? Talk to get you. experience in something you love. And then build your network because relationships are key in the consulting business. I agree with that. Absolutely. Emma? Well, like I think uh, just giving it a, a good go, you don't have to do it the way that everyone else has always done it. There's no single path and make it your own journey. Hmm. And Joel? So, um being, you know, having the ability to think through problems from a variety of perspectives. So think about something that you've done or what you're doing that, that demonstrates that. You're thinking about the problems through different lenses and how you might have solved something previously. Yeah, I think that's a really great one. So I think um, in, in summary, to wrap it up, um, I think biased as I may be, I do think that, um, you know, being a, a new law career consultant is one of the most interesting and, and varied of all of the roles that we've all been hearing about in the summit. Uh, as you've heard from this panel as well, as a consultant, you can specialise in a subject area you're passionate about. So ESG for Emma or tech um, for Beth, you can advise on legal ops, you can analyse data, you can review, recommend technology to augment service delivery. You can improve the client experience and embed change or reinvent legal. So in short, I think you can really make the role whatever it is you would like to be. So on that note, I think our time has come to an end. So it's time to give a huge thanks to our fabulous faculty for this session. We hope you enjoyed it and hope you enjoy listening. Thank you very much for attending. And a recording of this session is going to be available shortly as a video and a podcast. And don't forget, if you want to receive any updates about the release date of the recordings or work of the College of Law or the Centre for Legal Innovation, <laughs> Please make sure you follow them on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Bye for now. Thanks, everyone.